Okay, welcome back from lunch, everyone. I'm getting thumbs up that you can hear me. Good. Very enthusiastic this afternoon. Nobody's overwhelmed yet, right? <laughs> Ready to dive into mags. All right, so my name is Laura Sekiro. I'm an associate professor here at the University of Calgary. And of course, I'm a microbiome scientist. This is my first time teaching for CBW, but I'm really excited to be here. So I'll tell you a little bit more about my lab if I can get the slides to go. Yeah. So I, like I said, I run a research lab. We work on a couple different body sites, mainly the human vagina and the human gut. Um, but we also, I'm affiliated with both IMPACT and the International Microbiome Center. So at the International Microbiome Center, I lead the functional, sorry, I lead the microbial genomics as well as the bioinformatics or data science course. So these are fee-for-service fee core facilities that help enable, they're kind of like little boutique core facilities that help enable microbiome science across Canada and at the University of Calgary. Um, so we basically will handle people's microbiome samples from sample receipt all the way through data analysis and um, publication quality figures. We focus mostly on sequencing-based technologies in the core that I operate. So we have a lot of experience with a lot of different sample types, a lot of perspective from all that, not just our own research. And then for impact, I lead the functional omics um, platform. Um, so we are really trying to also make sure that appropriate standards and controls are utilized in microbiome science. We're thinking about our methods from that kind of uh, quality mindset. So some of that will sort of percolate into the lectures I give for the course. So in my program, uh, I work on the adolescent vaginal microbiome. So it's kind of interesting that it was mentioned earlier on in the at the beginning that we don't know much about the adolescent microbiome. And that's certainly true for the gut, but we're learning that in the vagina, it's actually really interesting. And it's a very developmentally unique um, process of colonization and change that happens in the vaginal microbiome during adolescence and young adulthood. So actually some of that will sort of percolate into the end of the talk as well as into the exercises, because you're gonna use some of our um, data sets from a cohort of Kenyan girls that we have been studying. And so within that, we really wanna understand what's driving the communities in the vagina to have a dominant taxon. So it's the only body site really in the human microbiome where there's a very dominant species, 90 to 95 plus percent of the community is typically one species of lactobacillus. And we're trying to understand how that happens and why does it happen only in this one body site? And we also are trying to understand how the vaginal microbiome affects risk of STI. We're also interested in preterm birth where we are working on novel virulence mechanisms. So I mentioned we're very interdisciplinary. We do a lot of laboratory culture work on this part of our projects. And then we've been developing a program in the gut brain connection, working on Parkinson's disease and neurodevelopment with a number of collaborators. And we use metagenomics really in all of these areas. So again, a lot of uh, perspective of using these in very different types of body sites, different types of samples, different types of questions. So I also have kind of a passion for teaching bioinformatics to non-coders. <laughs> and I think maybe because I came to it from that way, I don't have a degree in computer science. I came with a classical microbiology training, epidemiology, statistics, and then I was like, I wanna do bioinformatics too. So I actually teach a course here at the Cummings School of Medicine at the University of Calgary on um, bioinformatics for non-coders. We call it bioinformatics resources because there are so many resources out there now um, in cloud-based platforms, web-based platforms. It is definitely a lot lower throughput. You can't do everything as fast as you would if you had a cluster that you're working on yourself. But I have these little symbols throughout my talk where I kind of highlight how you can access different tools in different ways because not everyone's gonna come away from here and do all of this work at the command line. I can tell you from having my own experience learning it as a postdoc and having trained many students and postdocs, if you're not committed to doing it every day for six months, it's gonna be really hard to learn. Like you need that level of commitment. Um, so I do have some learning goals in here that you can circulate back to um, as you review the lecture and as this um, is posted online in posterity. And so we'll just come back to the beginning, just to refresh our minds why we're here. These complex microbes, right? 
found everywhere, perhaps even on Mars, all different kinds of um, habitats. And there's just, they're everywhere. We need to learn so much about them. And yet there are so many of them with a biomass on earth equal to that of plants. And yet only about 1%. And still, this is an old number from the eighties and I can't really find any updated numbers out there. Um, about 1% maybe has been cultured. So we still have this real lack of being able to understand all this biodiversity, to being able to discover new microorganisms and the genes or proteins they encode without metagenomics. We really are reliant on this technology. And I think throughout the talk today, you'll sort of see how it's taken over even how we approach genomics from a microorganism standpoint. So I'm not, I, I wasn't able to, to join this morning, unfortunately I had something come up last minute. Um, but I, and I, hopefully I'm not blowing a big hole and I'm in Morgan's nice talk, <laughs> but you know, this is the reality. There's always blind spots in everything that we do in this uh, realm of science, particularly in metagenomics. Um, and, and when you've thought about and learned about these short read techniques, the reality is that they're a hundred percent reliant on reference databases. If you're going to detect an element of sequence, it needs to be in a database for you to see it. Otherwise, yeah, you won't see it. It may be there, but you won't see it. And this is a lot, sort of a long-standing problem in metagenomics. We actually call the dark matter, the things in there that you don't see. And so what we're going to talk about this afternoon is kind of how we can maybe get around that a little bit by using assembly, by, by using de novo assembly as a way to be able to see and detect sequences without being 100% reliant on a reference database. You know, I think the other thing that's important to realize is that, you know, until recently, these databases only contained information from that 1% cultured microorganisms. But now that we are doing the process I'm going to tell you about today, where we're sequencing metagenomes and binning out these metagenome assembled genomes or MAGs, now those are starting to populate databases. It's just starting to happen. And it's not even always super easy to tell sometimes whether a database is just cultured isolate genomes or cultured isolate genomes and mags, but that's starting to come together. And I think it will be routine in the next couple of years that all mags that are good enough quality and all isolate genomes that are good enough quality will be together in databases. And that's how we're gonna grow our understanding of microbiology. So by working with these assemblies, you'll be able to detect and study novel components of your metagenome with greater detail. It's not that you can't tell at all that they're there sometimes, but you really can't resolve to a fine level their taxonomic assignment, and you really can't understand what new genes or proteins they may encode without doing assembly. And then of course, when we resolve these mags, then we can come to a genome resolved understanding of these novel clades. We can really start to see how they fit into the tree of life. And then we can come to an allele resolved understanding of microbial function. And I think this is huge, right? If you think about human genomics and cancer, everything is allelic resolution, right? SNPs and what alleles do you have? And, and that's how we understand human disease. And why are we ignoring that when it comes to microbes? It's just what genome or bug you have? No, it's what allele you have. It's just that we're not there yet. We are having a hard enough time drilling down into what bugs you have and what genomes they have, but we're getting there. We're just starting to get there. And I'll give you some examples today of, of how it's so important. Like we're seeing it's critical really for understanding. And then adaptation and exchange. There's been some really exciting things happening in metagenomics in this area. So I'm gonna highlight a few things on that at the end. All right, so remember, all those pretty pictures, all those microbes, they're multi-kingdom, right? Let's come back to this for a second. We have to think about this a little bit when we're talking about mags and assembly. We have a multi-kingdom operation. We have all of these different components at different abundances. This is the sort of current understanding of, of what we have in humans. Does assembly and benefit and binning benefit studies of all kingdoms? If you're interested in fungi or viruses, does this technique work for you? And the answer is a little complicated. It depends. It depends how you prep your sample. And it depends, you know, how abundant these things are in that sample. Um, you know, you can enrich for certain types of organisms in your sample prep and bring them up in abundance. But other times they're just, things are too low in abundance to be able to really 
be beneficial in this method because you need to have adequate coverage of the genome. And this is a concept that will kind of come up throughout the talk and throughout the workshop coverage. You can just think of it if, if you have all of the genomic content in your sample, right, coming from all these different organisms, and you were going to throw a blanket over that, you're going to cover it all up. That's one X. How many levels of blankets do you need to cover up all of the genomic content in your sample before this will work? And the answer is you need to cover it 10 to 50 times. So if you have stuff in here that, you know, you don't have enough reads to cover all of that content 10 to 15 times, basically you're not going to be able to detect it using assembly and binning approaches. The other thing that you have to think about with this is genome size, because coverage of different organisms in a mixed sample is affected by the size of those genomes. And so this is sort of showing you then the range of genome sizes for what we could consider different groups of microorganisms. And so you can imagine that if you're studying a microbial eukaryote, you're going to have a really hard time getting enough coverage unless it's really abundant in your sample. So these things interact. And essentially, if you have a larger genome, you're going to need more reads to get that coverage. And if you have a less abundant organism, you're going to need more reads to get that coverage. So you end up in a situation where you could make it work for everything, but in practicality, do you have that much money <laughs> to get all those reads? So there are limitations with this method. And where it's really shown is with bacterial genomes. They're in that sweet spot of size and abundance. That this, this works really well. But that's not to say that the tide isn't starting to change. We're going to talk in just a bit a second about how sequencing is getting cheaper and cheaper. And with that, we're just seeing these enormous metagenomics projects, 300 billion. Okay, that's a lot of reads to work with. The ones that you guys are going to have in your, the samples, the metagenomic samples that we've given you in your workshop today, there are a couple million per sample, a couple million. So this is many orders of magnitude more reads that they worked with in this study, but they did succeed. They binned a bunch of eukaryotes. It's pretty cool. This is pretty new. So, you know, it's not impossible. Maybe we're getting there, but for the most part, this has been applied in bacteria, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So I mentioned that sequencing, of course, is getting cheaper. And, you know, we're all really being driven by this, this goal of the cheap human genome, right? Us microbi microbial genomicists, metagenomicists, we're sort of just being dra dragged along <laughs> with this. And so you may have seen this figure before where this line, Moore's Law, let's see if I can get a laser pointer up here is basically the cost of computer processing power. It's decreasing over time as computer processors get faster. And when we had invented technologies leading to sort of high throughput parallel luminous sequencing, we really dipped below that. Sequencing became a lot cheaper. Then we've kind of matched Moore's law since then. And we've gotten to the $1,000 human genome. And a lot of people think that we're on the precipice of making this next big drop in parallel to Moore's law um, with this new $100 genome technology. So we'll see how that goes. But as metagenomicists, we're being strung along, and hopefully we eventually get to the $10 human genome. And so how does this benefit us as microbiologists? I think one thing that's important to realize is that, you know, the human genome is way bigger than the standard microbial genome, which means that, um, you know, we could really be sequencing enormous numbers of microbial genomes for the same cost. But this is the reality of cost. If we're at $1,000 on the human genome, we're at about 100 bucks for a... Uh, bacterial genome. And so the cost per megabase is still way, way higher. So this is a limitation for us. And this really comes from the fact that while the sequencing is getting cheaper and cheaper, the molecular biology kits, the tools for getting the DNA out and making the libraries, those are still quite expensive. And we have to make one of those for every single library, for every single bacterial genome. And so this is why metagenomics is so powerful, because while we could be sequencing 6,600 bacterial genomes every single week on an Illumina instrument, we're not. It costs too much. We can't culture all of these and get all these libraries made. The HMP, the Human Microbiome Project, when they wrapped up about seven, eight years ago now, they had had this goal of culturing and making genomes for all of these you know, human microorganisms, this huge goal. And I was part of one of the labs that had a culturomics project for vaginal microbiome funded by the HMP. When they concluded this is how many new genomes, like these were new, not just ones we've seen before, brand new genomes, brand new organisms, 3,000. Not very many, right? 
Now they've continued to expand and elaborate on that in, in the years since, but still, if you look at databases today, I mean, this is what's in them. When you look at cultured isolate genomes, yeah, there's a million, but 75% are prokaryotes. When you look at what's important for human health, a taxa like what used to be Bacteroides doria and now has a genus I don't like to say, um, 114 genomes total. I'm doing comparative genomics with vaginal bugs all the time where I have one or two genomes for these really important species. So we just still don't have the technology and the knowledge and we can't go about this the slow way anymore. We have to embrace mags and we are. It's becoming the way of the future. So I'm gonna tell you today about how we make these mags and, and give you continue to give you a impression of how important they are. There's three main steps that we're gonna talk through and then you're gonna work through with your tutorial, assembly, binning, and annotation. This is computationally intensive. You will find in your tutorial later that there's very few parts you can actually execute. Most of it's gonna be looking at files that we executed on the scientific compute cluster for you. It really can't be done, not really any of it on your own computer. You have to have a compute cluster to do this kind of work. Um, and the other thing about it is while you can use wrappers and build pipelines that kind of automate this, and we've been doing that, many others have been, it does require, you know, quality assessment and human intervention with, within each of the three steps. And every new set of samples can throw new challenges at you with this because of these dynamics of how many reads, how, how diverse the samples are, what your coverage is, things like that. So it requires some intervention. Where we're at right now is that steps one and two, assembly and binning, I'd say they're relatively standardized. There are multiple tools to accomplish every step, but really they're not that different from one another at this point. We kind of have by and large agreement of, of what kind of is working. But then when we get to step three, you know, it's really dependent on what you do on the system you're working in and the questions you have. And that's where we're gonna throw more options at you and try to get you to think about, you know, what you need to be thinking about with the choices you want to make for your questions, um, particularly with step three. So this is the simplified workflow that we were able to come up with for the tutorial to give you a sense of the entire process, a sense of the steps, the coding that goes into the entire process. I'll show you at the end of the talk, complicated workflow. Trust me, this is simple. <laughs> we tried, but there's still are a lot of steps. And it's the reality. There's a lot of steps in this process. So without further ado, let's get going. So what have we done so far? Recall, of course, we've done all this stuff in the wet lab. We've gotten some samples with complex DNA from different organisms in it. We've extracted that DNA, we've made a library, and we've gone on to sequence it. I'm mentioning this again now because assembly, the first um, part we're going to do here, is perhaps a little bit more dependent on what happened with your library preparation than some of the other methods in metagenomics. So just to remind you that when you make a library, you take your DNA and you fragment it. You can do that in different ways with sound waves, with enzymes, but the size of those fragments affect things with the assembly in relation to the, the reads that you generate. The other thing that affects assembly is the technology you used to generate your reads. Did you do next generation sequencing, which we often just refer to as short read sequencing? Or did you do third generation sequencing, which we often refer to as long read sequencing? Or did you do both? So what kinds of reads are best for assembly? Um, this is the only slide I'm gonna show you that really puts together these two very complicated um, processes and technologies that have been developed. Um, there's actually multiple technologies and platforms for sort of each brand or each type of sequencing. At the very end of the lecture, there are links to videos that show you it through animations, how these different technologies work. So if you wanna learn more about that, um, you have some resources. But basically with next generation sequencing, most commonly Illumina um, or long read sequencing, which is most commonly either Oxford Nanopore or Pacific Biosciences, um, you know, both of these will work for assembly. People tend to do for shotgun metagenomic short read in part because it's still cheaper. Also, you can get a lot more reads for the money. So you can get higher coverage. Um, the other thing about um, short read sequencing is that you have higher accuracy and that can be import really important for assembly. So this is still the most commonly used method is short read. And that's all we're going to talk about today. Um, 
you know, I just want to make the point also that factors that can reduce assembly, anything relating to poor quality. So if you have base calling errors, ends, adapters you haven't dealt with through your QC, if you have, um, I mentioned that your library makes a difference. So if your fragments are too small relative to your reads, such that your reads end up overlapping a lot or reading through, that's not good for assembly. There's ways to deal with it, but what you want is ideally is your fragments to be longer than the two reads, the two paired reads are in opposition of one another so that they don't overlap. There's like space in the DNA fragments between the forward and reverse reads. You'll see why in a minute. <clears throat> and you don't want your reads to be so too short, which is in part why most days, most people nowadays hardly ever do anything less than 100 base pairs. And as I mentioned, you have to always think about coverage and it's hard to perfectly predict. You can try to predict it and plan your experiments, but if something ends up going weird, your sample's got way more taxa in it than you thought, you end up with low coverage of those individual taxa, again, assembly will break and you'll have an, a more fragmented um, result. Um, it is important that you max, um, that you uh, match the, assembly algorithm with the type of reads. So some algorithms are for short reads, some algorithms are for long reads, and there's some that bring both together. And when you do bring both together, you can improve contiguity of your beta genome. But again, because of the lower accuracy of the reads, um, challenges with getting good coverage, the throughput for the longer reads, it's less common in, in um, assembly and shotgun metagenomics. And I'll, I'll show you in a minute why it's sometimes used still. Okay, so assembly in a nutshell, you can think of it, um, it is de novo, so it's driven purely by the reads without a reference. You can just think of it simply as the overlap consensus model, right? So you have all these reads, you're just figuring out where they overlap, and then that overlap fragment of DNA becomes your contig, your consensus contig. In reality, all shotgun um, metagenomic assemblers use De Bruin graphs, a slightly different method. Um, but conceptually, for the purposes of this course and this diagram, you can think of it that way. There will be some links I'll tell you about later where they have lots of videos and tutorials about all these different algorithms for assembly that you can look at later. But if you take your reads, you do this overlapping consensus, you get the, the longer pieces that they can be assembled into, we call those contigs. We then go a step further and we link contigs together into scaffolds. And the way that we do this, um, it's usually within the same assembly program or same assembly package, but it will map the reads back to those assembled contigs. And when you have a read pair where the forward read maps to one contig and the reverse read maps to another contig, you can infer that maybe those came you know, from a fragment that, that just didn't assemble well in between there. So it kind of helps you to order and to figure out how these contigs relate to one another. So there'll be a few more pictures here that will sort of illustrate this. So you can then now kind of picture this as this fragment of DNA that you made into your library. You got the adapters on the end, you have your forward read, your reverse read, and you have this insert size or the distance between them. So if you've got these two contigs and this read maps to contig A and this read maps to contig B, you can infer that these would go together in this orientation. And so what it does when it makes a scaffold is it inserts ends between the two. So it adds ends into your assembled genome between these contigs because it doesn't know exactly how much space is in there. Um, so there is a little bit of guesswork that goes into scaffolding, but in general, it helps still helps you to bring things together and make your assembly more contiguous. So the preview then for your tutorial is that you're going to be doing assembly with metaspades. There are a few different algorithms that are used for metagenomic assembly. Metaspades is one of the most popular. Another really popular one is MegaHit. So you'll get a chance to try this out in your tutorial or at least see the outputs because <laughs> this is very computationally intensive. So there are lots of ways to scaffold. Um, the way I just described where you map your short reads back to the assembly is the most common, but there are others. Um, and this is where long reads is sometimes brought into this process to improve the scaffolding of a metagenome. Um, the reason that it helps is that the long reads can bridge these repeat sequences and then enable you to actually assemble them. 
So repeats break assemblers, but if you have a long read that spans the whole repeat, you can assemble it. The other thing is that, remember I said there's a low accuracy or a lot of erroneous base calls in long read sequencing, which is why if you're going to use it for de novo assembly, you have to really get a lot of coverage and it's expensive and hard to do. But if you're just using it for scaffolding, you can take your highly accurate short reads, make your contigs out of those, use your long reads to figure out this ordering. So then the errors in the long reads don't matter that much. The erroneous base calls don't matter, but it's helping you figure out what sequence goes between contigs, and it's helping you figure out what order and orientation the contigs go in. So that's where it can be quite helpful to have long reads in addition to short is for scaffolding. And just FYI, like these technologies are also continuing to evolve so that now we have um, four megabase reads that have been obtained from the Oxford nanopore minion exceeding the, length, the typical length of a bacterial genome. So that's like a whole genome in one read. Gonna have a lot of errors in it, but it's still pretty cool. Okay, so you've assembled your metagenome, now what? So you have to check out the quality. How did it go? Um, and for that, we use this tool called Quest. There's also a version called MetaQuest that does some special things, but we're not teaching it in the course, but you could be aware of it. It will tell you the number of contigs and scaffolds that you got, the total assembled length, um, the N50, which is a measure of contiguity. It means it's gonna be a number, and you can think of it as that, um, 50% of the nucleotides in your assembly, they belong to contigs or scaffolds that are at least that length, so that length or longer. If you use QUAST and you give it a um, reference genome, or if you're doing metagenomics, this is where you have to use MetaQuast and you can give it multiple reference genomes, then it can tell you about misassemblies. But because it's kind of a pain to always try to anticipate or figure out what's in your sample and find all those reference genomes, we usually skip this step but it's something that you can look into if you really want to know, you know, if there's misassemblies or you want to improve that. Um, so you'll get to look at cost as well as a different way to look at these same metrics through um, a package called Seek Kit during your tutorial. So this can be used just to evaluate what happened with your assembly. You can use it to compare different assembly algorithms, see which is performing best with your data. You can tweak assembly parameters. Um, and then there's also some link filtering that goes into the subsequent steps, and you can also tweak that and look at um, how it affected your overall assembled metagenome using QUAS. Okay, so it has a lot of really important uses. We tend to run it a lot as we're iteratively improving our assemblies. Okay, so we have really gotten through the first part, assembly evaluate how it went and filtering, which I'm not gonna talk about because you'll go through it quite a bit in your tutorial. Um, what can you do now? So I just wanna point out real quick, while we're gonna focus the rest of the lecture on binning, um, making mags, there's still a lot you can do with an assembled metagenome. So you can map reads to it and you can look at, um, you know, whether you have changes in coverage um, in certain regions, suggesting that maybe certain strains or subset of the population has lost that part of the genome. Um, you can also look at SNP calling and do allele analyses, you know, just with assembled metagenomic contigs and reads without ma making mags. So you don't always have to make mags. And really the most advanced work these days, it kind of integrates all these things together. So the reality is sometimes you're analyzing your assembled contigs from a metagenome. Sometimes you're analyzing your mags. Sometimes you're doing short read metagenomics and you're integrating all of it together to capitalize on the strengths and unique attributes of these different techniques. So don't think that there's only a one size fits all solution. Okay, but mags. Mags have special uses and we're gonna um, you know, get to the point where you understand that. So how do we make them? A meta a metagenome assembled genome. Thank God that they made an acronym because that's hard to say. Um, so we, we just refer them as mags. Sometimes they're referred to as bins. And for the purpose of this workshop, I just decided to kind of have a distinction between those two for clarity. Like they can be used interchangeably depending on, yeah, they're used interchangeably in the field, which is kind of annoying. Um, I decided for the purpose of the workshop, I'm going to call it a bin when we've just had it spit out by a binning algorithm. And when we've checked it out and we're happy with it and we think it's good quality and we want to move it into annotation, that's when I'm going to call it a mag. 
because then I'm going to treat it like a genome. But sometimes your bins, they're sort of useless. They're not good enough quality to go forward with. So to me, that's not a genome. But that's just my personal kind of way of thinking about it. In reality, when you read papers, you'll see these interchange, and there's no hard definition line between them. But you can think of how we get these as solving a puzzle. So puzzle pieces, right? They have um, surfaces. They have pictures on those surfaces or colors. They have shapes. And we use this information to sort our puzzle pieces and figure out where they go, fit them together to make a picture. So you can think of the pieces as your DNA scaffolds. And the strategy for assembling your puzzle is binning. So the surface of the piece, we, we also are looking for patterns. We're looking for patterns in our pieces or our scaffolds. And the patterns that we're looking for are tetranucleotide content or GC content. Those patterns tell us about phylogeny. They tell us about what goes together maybe in one genome. The shape of the piece is another piece, something we look at, which is the abundance. So when we map the reads back to the assembled contigs, we look at how many of them stack up, how many layers of blankets stack up on that contig. That's coverage. If you had an abundant organism in your sample, you're going to have high coverage of it. If you had a low abundance organism in your sample, you're going to have lower coverage. Remember that genome size factors into that as well, but in general, then you can link coverage to abundance. And so these are the two things that we put together to bin. These are the things, the signals that tell us how to put together the puzzle of which scaffolds came from which genome. So we have tools for this. Um, we don't, we're not teaching Anvio. It's something we're still in my group, still just starting to use, but it's really, really powerful and well-developed. Lots of tutorials on their website. Um, you still have to, as far as I understand, fully install this um, in an Ubuntu system, have computational resources to run it. Once you've run it, you do get some nice HTML and kind of like web-based um, visualization options, but it's not really accessible from my understanding for non-coders yet. Um, and so then the, the two that we're going to work on in the class, Max, Max Bin 2 and Metabat 2, they're very, very commonly used also in, in folks, um, by folks in their pipelines. So those are the two you'll work on today in the tutorial. Okay, so this is a little, um, I'll walk you through this, um, this little diagram. I mean, it's like a little animation of, of, of this whole process. So I'm just going to try to get this all to gel one more time in your brain. And you can go to this link. I got this off the web, so thank you for them to, for making it. You can go to the link and watch it later. So it's just kind of a fun little an animation just to remind you of what we have. So we have our mixed community and we extract the DNA. And in that, there's chromosomes, right, from each of these different organisms. And we're going to do shotgun metagenomic sequencing, so we're going to make reads. So different reads, read pairs, are going to come from each of these genomes. But the thing is, we don't know which came from which, right? That's the whole problem of metagenomics. They're all grayed out. So to figure that out, we're going to assemble them into our scaffolds. And then we're going to generate this data. We're going to basically look at the information in the puzzle pieces, the coverage. And so to do that, we map the reads to the context to look at the coverage, how many layers of blankets stack up. And this is sort of giving you a couple numbers on those chromosomes. So it's saying that. Chromosome five, that organism um, was more abundant than the one that you see in blue, chromosome two. So that's just kind of like giving you a, a hint what kind of information you got. You look at the sequence characteristics. So here's like a tetranucleotide table and you're basically enumerating the frequency of each of these tetranucleotide sequences within your contig or scaffold. Okay, so then you have these scaffolds. You don't really know which one's which, but through the magic of this coverage and the characteristics of tetranucleotide, um, you can figure out which ones go together. And so you can get all the scaffolds that came from chromosome or organism five together, and you can get um, all the scaffolds that went with chromosome organism two together, and you can then treat these essentially as draft genomes for those organisms. So this is the process. Um, there's uh, some additional steps that often happen after the binning these days, refinement steps. There are a number of tools and there's general approaches. And so basically um, people will run binning multiple times. They'll run it with multiple algorithms. 
And then you kind of iteratively, iteratively can aggregate and deduplicate bins to try and figure out like which combination of um, bins, when you put them together, makes the best final mag, if you will. Um, this takes into account these quality metrics. I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, the quality metrics that are used to describe now not the assembly, so not just cost, but the quality metrics that describe the bin or the mag. Those go into this process. And then sometimes people reassemble or they take just the scaffolds that went into that bin, map the reads to those, subset those out, and reassemble just those reads together. So that process is an option in uh, refinement. The refinement that you're gonna try out today is in this program, MetaRap, and it integrates the binning refiner tool as well as some of the quality metrics and kind of does its own thing. And if you're kind of wondering at this point, how do you choose? Like when there's all these different ways that you can put together these mags and refine them, how do you choose? So when you look in the literature at a new tool, you'll see often that they've benchmarked it. They've studied how well does that tool perform. Sometimes though, when it, they're promoting their new tool, right, they're a little biased, <laughs> but there can be really good data. So this is from the paper that um, released this tool, MetaWrap. And it's actually kind of a wrapper. So a wrapper brings together existing tools and makes it easier to use them and integrate them. Oftentimes when people do that too, though, they, um, implement some of their own strategies and sort of link things together in their own unique ways. So that's what MetaRap does. You can actually use MetaRap to do the whole process I just showed you in the animation, but in your tutorial, you're just using it for refinement today. But you can look at these papers, you can find data like this where they've compared what happens when you do different binners, what happens when you do different refiners. And you can find there's also this effort, this critical assessment of metagenome interpretation or CAMI. So this is an organization and they've, they've come up with synthetic data sets and test data sets and they've had competitions where people try to figure out what's best. And so this is a MetaRat paper using CAMI data, which means you know what genomes went into that metagenome and then you're looking to see how well do the binners get those back out of that synthetic metagenome. So you can go into papers and study what, how does a tool perform with CAMI data? How does the tool perform compared to other tools? I'm not gonna walk you through these data, but these are just some of the data from the MetaRap um, paper where you know they're basically kind of showing here that you're getting more high quality bins when you do refinement. You could kind of just appreciate they're sort of more um, bars, they extend further to the right when you do refinement than when you just do binning alone from these different metagenomes from different sample types. So that's the kind of data that we use to decide what to use, but it's not ever a final answer, right? We have to kind of let time roll on and all these different studies evaluate the tools. And because I like pictures, I just pulled a few pictures out of this. I think these kind of, these are fun pictures that are sometimes made with binning um, studies. So these are all of each little dot is a scaffold and they've colored them based on the abundance and then the GC content, uh, or sorry, they've arrayed them based on abundance and GC content. And the colors here are, you know, high level clades. They're basically from phyla. Um, so you can see that, you know, there's some differences in GC content, some differences in abundance among these phyla, but it's still a little bit nebulous. And then this is the one where they've colored it based on bin. So you can see a lot more discrete coloring. The bins really have separated things based on this GC content and abundance, which we expect, right? And it's just kind of a fun little visualization of it. Okay, so we talked about assessing our assembly quality with Quest. This is how we assess our bin quality. This is one area in um, metagenomics and mags where everybody uses the exact same tool. <laughs> Check-in is the go-to go -to tool for um, assessing um, quality. And so its goal is to define the completeness and contamination using lineage specific single copy genes. So single copy genes, it's a gene that's found in a genome and only one time. And these tend to be housekeeping genes. They tend to be things that are really important. Um, and, and so in order to do this, they've come up with some neat 
tricks though to make it more accurate, which is why everybody uses this tool. Um, first, they have a, a process embedded in the program that takes your new genome or bin, and you can use this with isolate genomes as well. In fact, it's starting to become standard that isolates are also evaluated using this tool. So you take your genome or bin and you put it on a tree by using universal markers. So genes that are in every microorganism, really, archaea or bacteria. You put it on the tree. And then based on that, you define a lineage specific set of single copy marker genes. So it turns out that when you hone this list of single copy genes by lineage, it's more accurate for assessing completeness and contamination. They also account for co-localization because a lot of these single copy genes that are essential for certain pathways, they're found together in an operon. And so they're not independently telling you anything about whether your genome is complete or contaminated. So they account for that, which is pretty cool. And then they're simply kind of counting. So how many of these single copy marker genes, lineage specific, are there? And the number that are there tells you how complete your genome is and how many are duplicated. Because you're not supposed to have two. We know that. So if you have two or three or four, that tells you how contaminated your genome is. Because this binning is not perfect. Sometimes you're going to pull in a contig that's wrong, and you're going to end up with a little bit of a chimeric genome. Sometimes you're going to leave something out you should have brought in. So none of this is perfect, and this tells you how it went. Another cool thing about this is it distinguishes between strain heterogeneity and species contamination. Um, it does that by looking at amino acid identity. It's kind of cool. And so if it's, um, they look at pairwise combinations and if it's amino acid identity greater than 90%, um, it, they consider that strain variance. And if the amino acid identity is less than 90%, they consider that species contamination. So it's kind of cool. Um, this is what your output looks like and you'll get to explore this in the tutorial. So you'll get a table. It'll tell you this marker lineage. This is not the identity of your genome. This is just where it kind of fit on the tree. And it actually is going to go in and look right at a node. So just because they have two things that are the same here for marker lineage doesn't necessarily mean you're going to look at the exact same set of marker genes. Sometimes you do, actually. It's like this one you did, but not always. Um, so it'll tell you how many markers it found. The marker sets then are where they've controlled for this operon structure bit. And then it'll tell you how many were missing of that. And it'll tell you how many were exactly one. And then it'll tell you how many were two, three, four, or five plus. Then it aggregates all that information into your percent completeness and your percent contamination. So you can just read this off. It's really convenient. You can ask it to deliver these little graphics for you. And here, every little stacked sort of side-by-side -side bar is colorimetrically showing you a marker gene in that bin. It's a green if it's showing you it's there in a single copy. Good. It's gray if it's not there, bad. And then your different levels of contamination are shown in the blue and the orange colors. So this is widely used. It's every paper pretty much, pretty cool. You can also ask this tool to call up QUAST and it'll tell you other things like the length of your bin, the number of contigs, the N50, so the standard kind of genome metrics. You can also do that separately in QUAST yourself. Um, they, in this paper for CheckIm, they kind of put together some language of how you can, you know, use words to describe where your genome falls. Um, later, they kind of redefined that. They made it a little bit less granular, um, and they came up with some quality definitions for MAGs, and they call that the MyMag criteria, and this is the paper um, that lays that out. So if you want to know how high in quality your MAGs are, you can, you know, look at these resources. Um, when you go to upload MAGs to SRA, they basically require you to, um, so basically you're going to put them into NCBI, and I'm not sure if the European databases require the same, but pretty much we're trying to get everybody to stick to these same quality um, descriptions, the MyMag. So you'll get to try out CheckIm in your tutorial. And like I said earlier, if you're happy with the parameters you've chosen to this point, you're happy with how the assembly went, happy with how your binning and refinement went, and you have some bins that are at least 50% complete and no more than 10% contaminated, you're good to go. You've got some bins you can carry forward and study just like you would study a bacterial genome. You can call those mags in my book. 
Sometimes for certain questions though, 50% is not cutting it. We need a more complete mag. So it varies on your question, what level of completeness is good to go for the next steps. And similarly with contamination, some people are fine with 10, some people are like, that's too much. I only wanna look at ones that have 5% or less. Okay, so we've done binning, two thirds of the way there. How it started, I think this is again, just a good opportunity to realize what an impact this has had on the field of microbial genomics. So this is circa 2017. 8,000 metagenome assembled genomes substantially expands the tree of life and how it's going now. Hundreds of thousands of mags in single papers. So I think it would be kind of fun. I don't know if you guys are all on the Slack site, but I think it would be fun for those of you in different fields. See if you can figure out in your field what papers had the most mags posted in the Slack site. Because like I didn't have a chance to go look at like what's happening in ocean, what's happening in soil. But I mean, this is human. Um, the second one is actually a blend of mags and um, uh, reference genomes, like, like cultured isolate genomes. But yeah, 100, and, 100 to 150 is kind of standard now for what we think of having when we have a lot of mags in, in a study, you know, and this is pulling everything out of our databases basically to get to these numbers. This um, second paper though, that kind of unified the reference genome, you know, we've come a long way from HMP, right? Our 3000. <laughs> um, this paper showed kind of neatly. So in green over here, these are mags. And then in blue, these are cultured isolates. So you can, this is a log scale. So our mags, every single like database, you know, what we have in it are mags that are two to two to three orders of magnitude. There's more, okay, how do I say this? More mags by two to three orders of magnitude than there are isolate genes, right? Like it's just, there's so many more now, hundreds more, um, factors of hundreds more. Um, and then we can see where they're from in the world. So we have a lot of mags coming from North America, very specific countries in Europe and China but we're not yet really getting all that genomic information from a lot of other places. And then interestingly here too, this is kind of shocking and frightening in some ways. Um, if you look at the species that are sort of called here, um, it just goes up, up, up. So we're not saturating. The thing is, if we take out singletons, ones we've only seen once, a map we've only seen once in one person ever, if we take those out, we start to saturate. Do we all have unique species in us? Seriously? Like, <laughs> that's what's happening here? Is that where we're heading? You know, so who knows? We're still trying to figure that out. Um, so there's some ver variations on the theme. Now, this is one that's very common in the field. It's not new, but a lot of times in this science, we do serial sampling. And the idea is you can sample like the same system or the same person multiple times and then make multiple assembled metagenomes from them. And you can kind of pull those together into one binning, or you can co-assemble them. And the idea there is that you can get more reads for certain taxons, maybe hit assembly sweet spots with resampling. So this has kind of been a trick used, I think, I don't know, certain fields may still use it a lot. Um, I don't actually use it, but it's a, something you'll see in this field, serial sampling and co-aggregation of bins or co-assembly of metagenomes. The other thing I think is cool is high C contact maps. So this is a different way to scaffold or bin. You can use it for both. Um, the idea here is that um, you make two libraries. You do standard shotgun sequencing, assemble that, and make a second library. And you trick, use molecular biology tricks to bring pieces of DNA together that aren't contiguous. So instead of having a little fragment that's 500 nucleotides long, you take pieces of DNA in a single cell, but they're not contiguous. This means that you can link together a chromosome that's in a cell with its plasmid, or a chromosome that's in a cell with the phage that's also infecting that cell and replicating. So it's confined, the crosslinks are confined to within a cell, but you don't have to have contiguity of the DNA that you get into this high C mate pair library. So it allows you to have a different strategy for binning and where it's really shining in the literature right now is linking plasmids to chromosomes and phage to host. And now with long reads, if you integrate high C with long read metagenomics, you can fully resolve and close strain level genomes from a metagenome. This is the future too, right? We can get to alleles, we can get to allele resolution and we can close it. We can know exactly what's in a genome. 
pretty cool stuff. Checkim, of course, it's the most popular tool for quality. Checkim 2 is in preprint. It has machine learning. It's going to be implemented in a very different way. It does very different things, but to the same end, still in preprint. So I think it's still being evaluated, and we haven't yet tried it. There's also Check V out there, and people are using that for viral genomes. So if you're interested in viruses, you can check that out. Okay, seven minutes. Go ahead and get through this. Um, okay, taxonomy. So you have these beautiful mags and you want to do stuff with them. You want to know what the name of the organism is. That's pretty standard, right? The way that this has become pretty standardized now is to use this tool GTDBTK. And it uses a particular way of defining taxonomy, the GTDB. We talked about it a little bit earlier in the course. I just took this quote from Laura Hug, who has taught this lecture for many years in the past, and she just said it so well. <laughs> This is exactly the way I feel as well. You can choose to use GTDB if you want, but it is a little weird sometimes. They rename things and they do it in a weird way sometimes. It's very systematic and understandable, but sometimes if your field is used to calling organisms by certain names, they won't show up by those names and it takes work to kind of cross-link things together. Still, however, it's just very fast and easy to use. Um, it's basically a fully a nucleotide identity based system of defining a species. If your genome is 95% nucleotide identity to another genome, basically it's in that same species. For certain clades, they bump that up to 97. And then they make sure that your genome has at least 50% um, of the shared genes with that species as well to, before they classify it. So you'll get to try this out and see how it works, what the um, outputs look like in the tutorial. So when it comes to annotating, wanting to understand what mags do and their functions, this is again where you have to think through some things. You're basically going to take this as like a genome and do the same things you would do to a genome. Call your open reading frames, annotate your genes, and then what I call structural elements. Like you may wanna know about things like um, um, transposons, pathogenicity islands, um, places where HGT has happened or phage insertions. You know, I call those structural elements. Um, but those are things that are in the genome that aren't really the same as like a function or uh, just a gene. So you need to know what you're looking for. Are you looking for metabolic pathways, functional groups, certain types of proteins, novel proteins, or these structural elements? And what you're looking for dictates the tools you use downstream. And is it going to be kind of a one-size-fits-all pipeline, or are you going to look for something really specialized, a tool that's going to go look in your mags for what you want? So you're going to explore and experiment a little bit with some tools that are specialized and more generalized in your workshop. You have to think about the scale. So it actually turns out it used to be like assembly was 100% the most computationally intensive part of this. And that's maybe still true. But now that we're with dealing with hundreds of mags, annotating all of them is also very computationally intensive. Now that we have so much information and so many choices in our databases, just unpacking the databases takes more RAM than assembling a huge metagenome. So you end up sometimes getting a little pigeonholed in what you can do downstream as well, based on the scale of your project and the resources that you have available. And some, some of these uh, licenses for functional groups are also um, licensed. Or, yeah, sorry. Some of the databases are licensed, which can also be restricting in, in some cases. So, I'm not going to go through the details of any of these. They're all complicated. They all do a lot of things. Um, this is just going to show you some of the common ones, RAST and Eggnog. Cool thing, they have online portals. You can upload your assembled scaffolds and your assembled um, bins or mags to these programs. They'll annotate them and either give you a, a web portal to like look at what they, they spit out, or they'll send you tables in an email. So there are ways that you can do this um, through the web uh, using these tools, but like, you know, this is even just what Eggnog does. It's, it's doing a lot. <laughs> so um, Proca and DRAM are the two main ones that we sort of put into the uh, workshop because they're very commonly used. Proca is pretty quick, doesn't use too many databases, pretty much have to use it at the command line. And DRAM, I think you pretty much have to use it at the command line a lot more databases, but it does do a lot of neat things. Like it gives you more tools for looking at metabolic pathways and modeling and looking at completeness and sort of really what, what is the aggregate function of this genome, which is tough to do, but it helps with that drum. It also, 
I like enzymes a lot. We do a lot of work with casines and proteases and it specifically goes out and looks for those and most other tools don't. So I like that. And if you're into viruses, it also has some cool tools for annotating viruses. So in the tutorial, you'll just get a chance and you may not get through all of it in class, but we just wanted you to have the opportunity to understand how many options there are for this last downstream part to try out and compare them. So you'll be comparing these three for sort of functional annotation. And then I just want to close with just a few fun examples of like what you're getting out of all of this. Um, so the first two examples are coming from my lab and I'm just going to go through them quickly just to give you some context of sort of what you get out of all of this and, and how sometimes it's still very challenging. Um, so I mentioned you're, you can get novel clades. Absolutely. So this organism, Fanny Hassia, it's a really prominent vaginal clade. It used to be called Adipobium vaginae. We knew Adipobium vaginae. It was one species, and we knew it was important, right? Well, I started doing metagenomics on vaginal samples, and lo and behold, I start to get all of these different colors here. So you can kind of see the blues are here, the greens are here, and the reds are here. So this is a pan-genome map. And when you see that kind of pattern, it means they are not the same species you put together the, these pangenome maps using identity thresholds. And this is a very low identity threshold, 73%. So basically, these were all called fanny or adipobium vaginae, all these green and blue ones, but they weren't. They clearly were not all the same species. It was very confusing for a time. Then I had these pink ones in my mags um, that I didn't know what they were. So we went on and we eventually showed that indeed there are three species in this um, genus, and we never knew it. And the reason we never knew it is that the 16S identity is over 98.4% full length. We would never know that these are different species until we had the mags. So now then we went back to these same samples that we got these mags, we cultured this thing, and now we're writing up an ISMI paper and naming it. So it helps you figure out and discover whole new bacteria for sure. One little note, when you do GTDBTK, if you have a novel species, this is what you get. You get S blank. It doesn't say, hey, bells and whistles, clink, clink, clink. You got something novel. It just says S blank. Or if you had G blank, you'd have like a novel genus. But I think a lot of times it kind of makes up a genus name, actually. But, but if it can't figure out the species, if it's truly a novel species, you get S blank. It's cool. OK, um, I'm going to go over by five minutes, I think, and then we'll be done. So. In the vaginal microbiome space, yeah, like I mentioned, adolescence, we have something really unique that happens. The tissue changes, hormones rise, right? Puberty. <laughs> Puberty happens. What happens in the vaginal epithelium is it thickens and it gets glycogen deposited. And we've known since the 1920s that that's when lactobacilli colonize. So we always say, oh, the human microbiome forms and is developed by, you know, early childhood. Nope, not all body sites, not all situations. Some of it does not get colonized and develop until later. Doesn't need to be till later. Hormones change things. So we've known since the 1920s, these lactobacilli, these big, fat, purple, gram-positive rods colonize the vagina when this happens. So it's always been thought that the glycogen feeds them. The tissue thickens, the glycogen is deposited by the host, and it causes the microbe to colonize by feeding it. We've never had proof of that. And we've had trouble proving it because if we culture these bugs, they don't grow on glycogen. Huh, well, that would be weird. Why does there glycogen in vivo? And why do we think this? Yeah, it's a big conundrum in the field. So for a long time, people thought that the host amylase was required to break down that glycogen into maltodextrins and the bugs would eat the maltodextrins. So it wasn't until 2019, all these genomes, it wasn't until 2019 we finally realized, oh, yeah, some of these vaginal bugs do have a polyulinase. A polyulinase can debranch glycogen. Some of these bugs can eat glycogen. I don't even know for sure why it took us so long to figure that out, but that's microbiology for you. So we wanted to ask, um, do they all do this in vivo? Do they all eat glycogen in vivo? Because what that paper showed is only certain cultured isolates could encode that polyulinase and break down the glycogen. Could they all do it in vivo? So we sequenced, we did a pilot. This is, and the samples you're getting in your tutorial came from this pilot, which is why I'm talking about it. We sampled them with shotgun metagenomics. We ran Metaflon, we looked at the composition and this is what we got. So these yellow here, 
This is Lactobacillus crispatus. And what papers are showing now from all over the world, this is the one that tends to be the first colonizer, we think, in girls at puberty. We don't have a lot of data to say this is always the one that colonizes, but it's always the most common around the world. So in this cohort of African girls, 65%, um, and these were older girls, like 17, most of them, about that, um, most of them still had lactobacillus um, dominating, lactobacillus crispatus. And this is the one that makes the pollulinase. It's really the one of the few that does. So we wanted to ask, do they all have a functional pollulinase? We wanted to use metagenomics to do that. So we assembled, we made mags, and we also looked at the assembled contigs, and we did this with cultured isolates for L. crispatus and these metagenomes. And we actually took metagenomes, not just from our Ken Kenyan girls, our 17 pilot samples. We also took these metagenomes from other um, published databases. And what we found is there's very high rates of functional inactivation. So 25 to 30% um, have a mutation in the allele that we've assembled, um, or they have lost the gene. And when we look at how they're losing the gene or how they're getting a mutation, what we find is there seems to be a thousand different ways to mutate or lose this thing. Okay, so if it's so important, why is it getting mutated so often, right? Like it's kind of a conundrum. We wanted to make sure that the metagenomics wasn't causing a problem with this. And this is kind of what's neat about this. We have these assembled, uh, or we have these reads. We can map back to a closed reference genome and we can see we have different coverages. But when we look at where the pollulinase would be, indeed there's a gap. So we can use both the assemblies, we can see some a, a gene is missing, we can map reads back to a closed reference and see a hole confirming that it seems like it's actually lost. We actually did PCR too, and it was 100% congruent. We could amplify the pollulinase from those we could detect it with metagenomics, and we couldn't amplify it in the others, which was kind of interesting because we think often of these mags as being kind of a consensus of different strains, but I wasn't able to amplify a subdominant strain with a pollulinase from these samples where they had seemingly lost it. So this is telling us again that we are really understanding allelic biology with, with what we're getting with our mags. We also link this to function and I'll just skip over it pretty quickly here, but we can link whether we see a detectable functional pollinase with the activity. And then with the benefit of mags too is we have the whole genome. So we can look at the phylogeny of the genome and we can overlay that with whether these genes are, certain genes are lost or mutated. And then we were able to show that in certain branches of the L. crispatus tree, there was a higher um, incidence sort of of mutation. And in certain branches, there was a higher incidence of loss, but none of this was geographically linked. So there are some really interesting things that you can do with um, metagenomics. I'm gonna pretty much stop. I have a few other papers in here um, on the adapt adaptation and exchange. And if you wanna discuss it when we're kind of walking around and doing the tutorial, Feel free to discuss it with me or read on your own. I just think it's important to realize that, you know, horizontal gene transfer and ex genetic exchange, we've always thought that it's not a good thing to study with mags. And, and this is one of the key papers that showed that there's some limitations with it. It's hard to bin those parts of genomes properly, but there were some really cool papers. Like we can still learn a lot about mobile elements and like what's going on um, with them. And so you can explore these. Um, figures and papers a little bit more, and I'm happy to discuss them with you. And really because of that, I thought it'd be fun to add in a tool at the end of your tutorial where you can explore predicting mobile elements. This is not necessarily the best tool for this. It's a brand new one, um, but we just, it was an accessible one because um, actually this is the process diagram for this other paper. <laughs> Didn't want to give you that in the course, yeah. Um, lastly, I'll close out just by saying that there are also lots of mags in databases, so you can do comparative genomics with mags through IMG. If, you, if you're not a coder and you want to use publicly available mags, they're in databases like this, and you can integrate them into comparative genomics through these databases. And there's a tool called KBase with a nature protocol that came out last year, I think. Um, and you can run all of these things that we're teaching you in the course through a web portal um, on this tool. So if you're not going to be a coder, you can still do a lot of this, just a little bit slower pace. And here's your links to the um, sequencing text. So thank you so much for your time. Sorry, we went a little bit over, but we get through the tutorial.